see. What the stinking hell are you doing still here? Elkins pulled Kid round to face him. Your station for unmooring ship is in the main sheets. Get up there! He knocked Kid away from him and stormed about in the chaos, looking for the men of his division. It was bedlam on the night-black lower deck, its hellish gloom lit fitfully by lanterns, a struggling mass of men, white eyes rolling in the shadows, the occasional gleam of equipment. Kid's heart thudded. In a matter of hours he might be fighting for his life out there somewhere. His mind flooded with images in which he could see himself cut down by maddened Frenchmen as they swarmed aboard after a fierce battle. He gulped and mounted the ladders for the upper deck. On deck, the darkness was lifting, slowly, reluctantly. A dank, cold dawn began the day. The decks themselves were unrecognisable. Braces, sheets and halyards were off their belaying pins and led out along the decks for easy running. The upper yards were alive with men. Urgent shouts shattered the dawn. Along the sombre line of warships there was a similar bustle, and lights began to appear all along the shore. Boya was already there, but did not answer Kid's greeting, shoving a rope into his hand. Clap on to that, and don't move from there. The landmen were pushed into place, their slow incomprehension maddening the petty officers, who used their starters liberally on backs and shoulders, while the seamen moved far above them, on the tops, out along the yards, and to the end of the jibboom. The pace slowed, and Kid saw a coalescing of groups about the officers. Tuesley paced deliberately, accompanied by Elkins, whose face wore a look of dedicated ferocity. Hands to the braces! One by one, the massive lower yards were altered from their perfect cross-ship position to a starboard furthest forward angle, the better to catch the cold, steady breeze from the northwest. On the forecastle, Kid could see the men crowded around the anchor tackle, although he could not see what they were about. He knew that deep below him at that moment the capstan would be manned by every hand left over from duties on deck, and he was grateful to have his work out in the open. The bustle subsided, and Kid ventured a glance at Boya. He was looking up to where the men waited on the yards and sniffed about for the precise direction of the wind. He noticed Kid and said quietly, Easy enough. She'll cast under topsails to larboard and then out going large. He shouldn't have anything to worry of. Boya was subdued. Kid realised that he was probably thinking of the woman he was leaving. Joe, do you think there'll be a battle? Maybe. And then again, maybe not. Who knows? Boya looked away and down to the rope he held. He let it drop and walked to the side of the ship facing Portsmouth and did something with a coiled line. There seemed no point in following. Grapple that boy, damn it! came faintly from forward, followed by a triumphant, Man the cat! Walk away with it, you lead bellies! From the quarterdeck echoed a booming shout. Make sail there! Lead along topsail sheets and halyards! Lay out and loose! Kid saw sail suddenly blossom from the topsail yards. The men on deck worked furiously at the tacks and sheets. Lay off the braces, you lubbers! Larboard head, starboard main, and larboard your crojic! From having her head so steadfastly into the wind, tethered by her anchor, Duke William began to move ever so slightly astern. With counter-bracing on the fore, her bow paid off to leeward, faster and faster. Hold taut! Brace a box! Kid was working too hard to watch, not really understanding what he was doing, but determined to give it his best. The wind, more brisk than he remembered, had a salt tang to it. Starboard head braces! Brace around those head yards! There was a distinct lurch as the headsails took up at precisely the time Duke William ceased her sternward motion. Having curved around to take the northwester on her starboard cheeks, she now paused. The big courses were sheeted in, and she straightened for the run south to St. Helens. Portsmouth now lay astern, the little cluster of dwellings, tap houses, and Tudor fords dwindling into an anonymous blur. Kid found that he'd been too busy to think of the forlorn tiny scatter of women who were all that remained of those still hoping against hope 
at the sally port. They would know now that the only way they would see their menfolk would be in their dreaming. Astern also was the fat bulk of the 98-gun Tiberius, smoothly following in their wake, the whiteness of her new sails evidence of her recent docking. Ahead was Royal Albion, her stern galleries glittering before the salt stains of the open sea could dull them. A pair of frigates was even further ahead, under a full press of sail, drawing away visibly on a course that would take them ranging far ahead out to sea. The low, dark green and black of the Isle of Wight slid by in the early morning, the busy little waves hustling in shore towards the far-off port, which Kid knew would be waking to another dawn, another working day. He hoped that his duties would keep him on deck. He felt both exhilaration and fear, the altered perceptions that come from leaving land and committing body and spirit to the sea. In one sense, he yearned for the certainties of life on land, the regularities that made up the day, the steady work and sleep, the warmth of being part of a wider community. But he was aware as well that, alone of his family, he was going to see great times, be part of a world event. Deep within, he felt his spirit respond to the challenge. The young wig-maker of Guildford was fading into the past. They passed St Helens and shaped course more westerly for the channel. Portsmouth finally slipped out of sight behind the foreland, and they steadily forged ahead down the coast for Ventnor and the last of the land. The breeze freshened, and at nine knots Duke William was sailing about as fast as she ever would. The sea hissed along her sides at an astonishing rate. Kidd doubted that even a horse at a fast trot would find it possible to keep up. They reached St. Catherine's Point, and beyond the prominence ahead, in grand fashion, Royal Albion reared up, then fell in a broad swash of white. Then it was their turn, the first sea sent in earnest by the broad Atlantic, sending their bow with its great jibboom, spearing up to the sky, then crashing down in a stomach-stopping smother of foam. Aye, see how she curtsies to Neptune when she reaches his kingdom? Bowyer said, smiling. Sails bellied out and hardened as the regular winds of the open sea predominated. In place of the fluky, changeable airs of inshore, there was a steadiness, an assertion of the primacy of sea over land. Kid's exhilaration began to ebb. The familiar outline of hills, fields and towns was now an anonymous green and black line, becoming more insignificant each time he looked. To a countryman like him, it was deeply disturbing to relate only to a wilderness of water, with nothing that could remotely be termed a fixed object. The ship was now very much alive. She rose and fell with vigour to the waves, forcing Kidd to move from one handhold to another, too afraid to trust his feet. Bowyer didn't even notice, securing the lines into seamen-like hanks at the belaying pins, his movements sure and precise. Fair wind at the moment. Should make soundings in a day or so if there's no more westing in it, he said, after a considered look at the ragged sky. And then we'll face up with the French? The enemy? Kid tried not to sound fearful. The Monsieurs? No, mate. With this wind, they're away off out of it, Bowyer said. Won't come up against them till we weather Russian, and then only if they wants to come our way. He smiled briefly. They may be out, but it won't be this way they're coming. Off to the Caribbean somewhere, my guess. Anyhow, our job's to put a stopper on any frog that wants to get to sea from now on. Kid hung on as he took this in. So there would be no battle soon. He didn't question Bowyer's judgment. He looked up at the masts. Now clothed with sails, they gave an impression of a certain clean beauty and grim purpose. He tried a few paces and hung on. There was definitely a rhythm. As he watched, the line of the deck forward lifted, hung and settled, and lifted again. He tried a few more steps and looked across at Bowyer, who grinned at him. Boldly, he crossed the deck to the windward side and grabbed a shroud, the wind in his teeth. Playfully, the wind plucked his hat and sent it spinning over the deck and out to leeward. 
Don't worry, Coffin, I'll find you another. But promise me next time you rigs your chin stay when you're on deck, though you said. There was never a definite time, never an exact defining instant at which England finally vanished. One moment the far line of the land was there, only just, and the next time Kid remembered to look, there was nothing but a horizon, innocent of anything but the rimming seascape. It should have been a special moment, leaving his native country astern, but he only felt a curious separation, one in which England carried on with its own cares, duties and pleasures down one line of existence, while Kidd and his watery world went down another. At breakfast on the lower deck, Kidd kept quiet. There was just too much to take in. Between decks there were new sounds, creaks, groans and random cracks that gradually resolved into a regular sequence. A long-drawn-out, deep-throated shudder, followed by a volley of creaks before a descending sigh of minor sounds. It was also a strange feeling between decks when there was no horizon visible to act as cue. Body perception said that the entire structure was rearing up and plunging down, but the eyes just as firmly insisted that everything was solidly unmoving. No sooner had they completed breakfast than Kid was startled by the sound of a drum, loud in the confined space of the lower deck. Cutting through the hubbub in rhythmic rolls, its martial sound volleyed irresistibly, an urgent beating, on and on. Instantly there was turmoil. It was clear that this was nothing ordinary. The concentrated look on men's faces told him that. With thumping heart it dawned on him that this must be the call to arms, a clarion call to duty. If this was battle, he could not be more unready. His anxiety turned to fear that he would let his shipmates down, that by his act others would suffer. He stumbled through the welter of activity. Bear a fist then, you useless lubber, yelled an unknown figure, passing over a detached mess table. He joined the stream of men striking the tables, mess traps, and all their homely articles into the hold below. The guns were being readied. Where before they had been mere background features of the living spaces, much the same as the old oak sideboard in the living room in Guildford, now they seemed to come alive, to crouch like beasts in Kid's sharpened imagination. Kid, is that you? A young lieutenant with a frown looked at him. Yes, sir. Number three gun, then, the lieutenant said irritably, more interested in his piece of paper. He moved on. Kid moved smartly to the gun indicated. It seemed enormous. Around it was a crowd of men casting it loose and taking up positions. The gun captain acknowledged his presence with a surly nod, busy checking his equipment. The lower deck was crowded with men, even though only one side of guns was in operation, on the weather and therefore higher side. With shrill squeals, gunport lids were raised on pulleys, allowing natural light to flood in and giving a close view of the sea outside. It suddenly dawned on Kid why the inside of the ports and timbers around the guns were painted in so bright a scarlet. The wind streamed straight in through the gunports, making him shiver but bringing a welcome clean sea tang. He wondered what else might be out there and ducked down to look out. The sea, bright after the gloom, slid past only a few feet down, individual flecks and flurries in perfect clarity. But of the enemy... There was nothing, just endless marching waves, looking much closer and more alive than on deck. It was surprising to feel the calming effect of the horizon. He'd made his first vital discovery of the sea, that in a world where every single thing seemed to be in motion, here was something that was fixed and solid, could be relied on, the line of the horizon. Straightening, he dared a look at the man next to him, he was thin and ugly and wore a beaver hat as shapeless as it was characterful. The man glanced around and caught Kid staring at him. He was very ugly, his face foreshortened like a monkey, the forehead disappearing too quickly into a stubble of hair. You're looking for a sass in the chops, cook, he croaked in a grog-ravaged voice. Kid mumbled something and tried to give his attention to his opposite number, 
an Iberian by appearance. The man saw him, but looked away in contempt, probably because he was a landman. The gun captain straightened and held up his arm. The man was all muscle, and with his striped shirt and red bandana closely tied over his hair, resembled a pirate. His eyes were hard and took in everything. Silence! Silence fore and aft! It was the young lieutenant, shrill with anxiety, pacing down the midline of the ship. The captain desires me to inform you all that it is his intention to exercise the great guns every morning without fail. So much for the enemy in mortal combat, thought Kidd, not sure whether to be relieved or disappointed. It seemed the officer did not know whether to keep his black Japan speaking trumpet behind his back or ready in front of him. We have the heaviest guns in the ship and therefore the most decisive weapons in battle. If we can hit harder, faster, then we will win. Otherwise, we will lose. So we are going to practice and practice until we are good enough. And then we practice some more until we are the best. Mark my words, any man who hangs back will be dealt with instantly. The seamen, waiting by their guns, watched him tight-faced or warily, as their experience told them. Gun captains! Prove crews in your own time. Carry on. The man in the red bandana spat on his hands. My name's Stirk. He fixed them with his fierce eyes. Now there's them what don't know me methods yet. He took in several of them with his glance. And there's them what do. Ain't that right, doggo? He was addressing the ugly man next to Kid, who grinned a gap-tooth acknowledgement. Yes, your ways is a right of it, Toby. Then let's get to it. Slow time, it is. Cast loose, Jukes. The gun was lashed by its muzzle into docile obedience, like an ox by its nose. Jukes, a nervous, slightly built man, pulled himself astride it and cast off the lashing, which he coiled neatly on the eye bolt. Watch your ass, another said, and paid out the side tackles in long fakes, while others passed over the implements of gunnery. Crow, handspike, sponge. Level guns! Once the coins were slammed in place, the canted appearance of the massive piece took on a more straight-eyed and business-like appearance. Tompion! The muzzle gaped open. Stirk stood back and looked appraisingly at them all. Right, let's have a few changes. Bull, I want you on the crow. Yeah, take it then. Pedro, we'll have you on the rammer this time. A barrel-chested man with a near-bald head pushed out and grabbed the crow from unresisting hands. The Iberian sauntered across to claim a long stave tipped with a cup-shaped piece of wood. Tension was reflected in his glittering dark eyes. Doggo, I want you to lead on the left tackle, and you, uh, what's her name, join him. Kid moved across and found himself in a line of men at the tackle four. He placed himself unobtrusively at the end. Stirk considered. Well, that'll do for now. Remember, you doesn't pull your weight or comes down on your hard, as you know. He took his position at the breech of the gun. Now, you know me method. We gets it straight afore we gets it fast. So we go through the drill by order. Stand by. He glared at his gun crew one by one. Run out the gun! While those with implements watched, Kid and the others tugged at the tackle. The monster gun sullenly ground a foot or two towards the port. On this point of sailing, the deck was canted, so the work was all uphill. Stab me, marvelled Stirk, but you're a useless porky lot. Let's have some real heavy in it, then! The gun moved out faster, but Kid was dismayed at the effort required to shift the three tons of cold iron. That's better. Now, come on, Jimmon. Remember your drill. Yous, clear the breaching from the truck. You and you, fakes out the tackle falls nice and neat. You don't want me reminding you all the time now, do you? So, prime! We doesn't take action here. Point your gun. He looked at Jukes, standing by nervously. Look, mate, he said. Keep your training tackle close up. Bite your fall after she fires, cos side tackles will be running out quick and they don't want it fouling. 
And Spike. I want yous right here and watching me all the time. Ain't no good admiring the view. Now the piece is ready to fire. Hey, put that gun tackle down, you kid. Gun goes off, it'll fly it and take you with it. Kid's face burned. Gun has fired. Denizen and Cullen with Dukes on the training tackle for now. With the cannon's recoil, they would need no training tackle for the real thing. The long black gun rumbled inboard, helped by the inclined deck and the training tackle fixed to the rear. Fully run in, its massive size, chest high to Kid, was overawing. Kid had a brief image of the parson and his gun. There'd been a spiteful crack from a barrel not much bigger than his little finger. What kind of earth-splitting sound would come from a gaping moor nearly the size of his head, he wondered. His palms began to sweat. Yours now, Lofty. Let me see some speed. The man was good at the task. Taking advantage of the gun port, he sinuously arced out of the port to face inboard, plying his sheepskin-tipped stave into the muzzle at the same time. Three twists to the left going in, three to the right coming out. Let's be having you then, Cullen. Where's your powder? A doleful-looking sailor went through the motions of going to the midline of the vessel, where a grinning ship's boy pretended elaborately to give him a cartridge from a long-covered container. Load with cartridge, Stirk ordered. The invisible cartridge was stuffed down the muzzle to Cullen's armpit. He whipped out his arm, by which time the Iberian had advanced with his rammer. Thrusting forcefully several times, he leapt back, the action like a dance movement. Wait for it, Pedro. Me priming wire has to feel the cartridge, and then I signals, and that's when you carry on. He gave a wintry smile. But that was smartly done, Cully. Shot your gun! An imaginary wad was slapped into the muzzle as two men bent to the shot rack, pretending to heave a shot onto the cradle. It would need, too, to carry the great 32-pound shot to the muzzle, where the cradle would tilt the ball in. Pedro! But the dark-eyed man was already there, plunging the rammer down. Wad! he shouted before Sturk could speak. A wad was passed into the muzzle. More plunges with the rammer, and they stood back. Good. Now we does it in one. Run out the gun! The exercise warmed Kid, and he tore off his jacket and waistcoat. It was not hard to learn the motions. The difficult part was to learn to pull together with the others and stop his muscles trembling at the unaccustomed effort. Ahead of him on the tackle, others were finding it hard as well, with panting and feverish mopping of foreheads. Doggo had doffed his shirt altogether, the feral hair over his neck and shoulders glistening with sweat. Now, lads, you needs to get low into it like this, he said, leaning into the line of the rope. The young lieutenant appeared distracted. Cease, exercise. Stand down. Stirk sat on the rear of the gun carriage, looking at them with a sardonic smile. A desultory chatter drifted around. What we waiting for, then? Duke said, peevish. Bull Lynch snorted. Why, you going anywhere? Well, let's just get the exercise over. Need to get me head down for a cook. The lieutenant reappeared, looking apprehensive. He raised his speaking trumpet. Pay attention, the gun deck. The captain means to exercise the great guns today with the discharge of one round from each gun. He hesitated, then ordered... All guns load with cartridge. Kid's heart quickened. He would hear the guns speak now. Sturg rose. Come here, Nipper, he said to their ship's boy. Now run along and get me patch from the gunner's mate. Kid had noticed the ship's boys stationed at each gun, some no more than ten years old, and had been touched by their youthful high spirits. He could not help but wonder how they could possibly endure in a great sea battle. You, Denison, match tub, and Cullen, you knows your sponge'll need water. Stirk checked carefully around, then went to the gun lock atop the breech of the gun. Carefully removing the lead apron, he attached a lanyard to the mechanism. Cocking it, he watched closely as it clicked a fat spark. Satisfied, he straightened. Thanks, Junker.
he said to the panting boy waiting behind with a pouch. He smiled at the lad. So where's your ear tackle, then? The boy brought out a grubby white rag, which Sturk fastened with mock roughness around his head. It was in the form of two circlets that went around the head, intersecting at the ears, where there were large pads. The others began tying their kerchiefs and bandanas over their ears as well. Kid felt awkward and apprehensive as he followed suit. Slinging the powder horn over his shoulder, Sturk waited for the loading process to complete. This time there was a real cartridge, a light grey cylinder with coarse stitching which held Kid with a horrifying fascination. It went in, bottom end first, seam downwards. Slow time, lads. We get it right first. More carefully than before, the dark Spaniard plied his rammer. This time Stoke had his thumb on the touch hole to tell by the escaping air when the charge was seated. A wad and then the iron ball itself. To Kid, it looked huge. Stirk noticed his interest. Right ship smasher, that. Go through two feet of solid oak at a mile, that, and will. The cradle tilted and the cannonball disappeared into the gun. Another wad would be needed to keep it hard up against the cartridge, against the roll of the ship. Run out! In a sudden bout of nervous energy, Kid hauled mightily on the tackle. Stirk took his priming wire, more an iron spike, and by piercing the cartridge through the vent hole, ensured that naked powder was waiting for the jet of flame from the quill tube. The gunlock pan was filled with gunpowder from the powder horn, and Stirk raised his hand. Stand by to fire! A flurry of clicks echoed along the gun deck as the gun locks were cocked. Gun captains stood behind their weapons, lanyards in hands, and kept their eyes on the lieutenant, who plainly was waiting for word from the quarter-deck far above. The ship heaved slightly, muffled creaks startling in the silence. The morning wind was strengthening and buffeting those closest to the gun port. Kid caught a glimpse of a lone seabird wheeling low over the sea. Still the waiting. The tension became unbearable. Kid stole a look at Stirk, who was calm but poised. He wiped moist hands on his trousers. A distant shouting and a face appeared at the forehatch. Stand by! Number one gun! Fire! In a split second, Kid saw it all. At the first gun, only two guns forward, the gun captain tugged hard at the lanyard. After the briefest delay came the stupefying din, the visceral push of the blast. It left him stunned. Then a vast, enveloping mass of smoke roiled out for a hundred yards or more before it was blown back in again. It swirled around them, briefly hiding the waiting gun crews. Number two gun! Fire! Kid knew what to expect and closed his eyes. The cannon was nearer and there was a vicious iron ring to the blast. He flinched. A trembling started in his knees. Now it was their turn. Stirk stepped back to the full length of the lanyard and waited for the order, a peculiar grin playing upon his lips. Number three gun! Fire! A series of images was split by violence. The stabbing tongue of fire at the muzzle instantly replaced by acrid gun smoke. The maddened plunge of the great cannon passed Kid to the rear. The frantic whipping of the side tackle until the gun came up to its breaching with a bass twang. The artistic arching of Sturk's body to allow the cannon to charge past as if he were in a bullring. And then it was over. Chapter 5 As Kid came on watch in the afternoon, it was clear that the weather was on the change. The wind had backed from a previously favourable light northerly and was now more in the west and strengthening. It moved forward of the beam and the old battleship had to thrash along close to the wind instead of a comfortable full and by. Her bluff bow met the increasingly steep but still relatively short waves of the channel head-on in a series of smashes that sent cold spray sheeting into the air, then stinging straight aft. 
Overhead, the lowering cloud base had turned into a dull, racing overcast. Kumas started to appear, vivid white in the unrelieved green-grey. By three bells, the wind had increased and it became necessary to shorten sail. In came the togallants and the main and mizzen togallant staysails. To balance this, the small jib was set. Kid found it increasingly unpleasant. In weather that on land would have people reaching for thick coats and scurrying thankfully for shelter, he found himself standing waiting on the upper deck as each sail manoeuvre called for more hauling than more inactivity. His suffering increased when drifts of light rain bore down in curtains of misty drizzle. The rain suddenly got harder, then stopped, leaving him shivering in the keen wind. The others on watch did not offer sympathy. To them, it was an inevitable part of being a sailor, to be endured quietly and with resignation. Some pulled on foul weather gear, shapeless woolen Monmouth caps and lengths of tarred canvas that hung down like aprons, mainly used by those going aloft. Luckier ones had a grego, a rough, thick coat, and over it a layered tarpaulin surcoat. Kid had none of these. His short jacket over the waistcoat had soon become sodden, and his trousers kept up a steady stream of water into his purse's issue light black shoes. Cold crept remorselessly inwards to his vitals. It seemed an age before the watch was over, and Kid was able to make his way down to the mess. The warm feeter of the gun deck, its buzz of talk, was welcoming. Supper was beginning, and the grog monkey swam dark with rum. Kid sat in his wet gear, letting the rum and the surrounding fug do its work. Bowyer stripped off his old tarpaulin overcoat, but underneath he seemed just as damp as Kid. Grievous wet, Joe, Kid said. Well, if you take it to hire every wet shirt you gets, why, you'll fret yourself into a stew. Of course, you has your sealskin warmers. Wear them under the waistcoat, you does. But I guess you'll want tarpaulin gear of sorts. Have to see old Nip Cheese about that. He seemed to find the grog as acceptable as Kid. Draining his tankard regretfully, he said, I'll see you right on that, mate, don't you worry. Can't be having you die a cold afore we make a topman of you now, can we? Kid looked at Bowyer in his faded seaman's rig and felt a surge of warmth towards the man. He gulped at his grog, sighed and smiled, looking around at his new friends, then rested his eyes on the stout side of the ship. As usual, condensation was running over aged blackened timber, but strangely it slowly transformed from a harsh, confining prison wall into a sturdy barrier protecting him against the unknown vastness of the ocean outside. Suddenly the ship gave a bump out of sequence, followed by a pitch of considerable vertical distance. The sudden movement caught Kid unawares, and his grog spilled down his front. <laughs> gets a more worse before he gets better, Hal said, watching Kid over his pot. Dowd ignored him. What's the chance of a real blow, Sam? he asked Claggett. Well, it depends on what you call a real blow. Claggett stared moodily into the distance. We'll have Portland coming a beam with six bells. If it doesn't back even more to the west, we can do it on this board, if that's what you mean. Dowd waited patiently. But if we don't make our westing soon, why then we'll be hooked down riding out in Torbay's somewhere. You know how it'll be, Ned. Kid broke in. What about the frogs? They looked at him with surprise. Way the buggers cannot move with this westerly, said Whaley. Build up and harbour they be. Cannot sail against a foul wind, see? A deeper lurch came. Kid could swear he felt the unseen wave pass all the way down the ship, the bows first rising to it, then, as the wave reached midpoint, falling off down the other side. Bowyer grinned. Let's get your foulies then, Tom. You're on for the last dog watch. Dusk drew in, but there was no easing in the weather. The wind by the hour swung west, strengthening as it did so, a hard, continuous blow in place of gusts and buffets. Scud raced overhead, ragged and low, and the ship laboured heavily. There goes our run, said Corrie, one of the watch. He pulled viciously at a line. Couldn't have stayed in the north for just another day. Oh, no. 
Now we'll be flogging him out all over the organ looking for a slant. It was clear that Duke William was unable to keep as close to the wind as the other two vessels. She sailed as near as possible, but she sagged sadly away to leeward of the newer ships, the line of three becoming a gaggle. From the main top of the Royal Albion ahead, a solitary flicker of light appeared. Kidd glanced up. Their own main top lantern produced its fitful beam for Tiberius astern. He gazed at the three decker ahead, working her way through the seas in a welter of foam, rising and falling in a foreshortened bobbing, clawing at the wind. As he watched, the vessel altered her perspective, changing track to conform to Duke William's laboured course, the line now whole again. Now that'll please the buggers. Now nobody is going to fetch start point on this tack, Corrie said. A cluster of signal flags made its way in jerks up Royal Albion's rigging, the bunting stiff to the wind. Now that'll be night orders, and welcome to it, he added with a sniff. Like as not, it'll come on a real muzzler tonight, and then what's the use of orders? The rain had stopped, but the wind steadily increased. Inside his new tarpaulins, Kid shivered, the slapping of the cape-like folds feeling awkward and uncomfortable. The odour of tarred canvas was strong and penetrating. A bulky figure in old, rain-slick, foul-weather gear stumped along the deck in the gathering darkness. It was the boatswain, accompanied by his mates, going about on a last checking of gear before it was too dark to do so. He passed Kid without recognition, then stopped and came back. Getting your sea legs then? he rumbled. One thing about foul weather soon sorts out the sailors from the lubbers. Then there was the familiar round of trimming, the tightening, easing, bracing, and other motions deemed necessary by the officer on watch on assuming the deck after which the men huddled beneath the weather bulwarks. The binnacle lamp was lit, and extra men sent to the wheel. The small group on the quarter-deck paced abjectly in the dirty weather, wet streaming from their foul weather gear. The night drew in. Kidd pulled his tarpaulins close, imitating the others who, sitting with their backs to the bulwark, had wrapped a weird assortment of gear around them. Of course, it could all end for us in an hour, you know said Corrie. How so? Oh, just think. Here we is, thrashing along with the wind, shifting all the time. Who's to say where we'll be at the end of the watch, in the dark? There was no answer, so he went on. Frenchy coast, only thirty miles or so off hereabouts, and it's sure enough iron-bound. Worst part of the whole coast is that. What if we gets to tack south when the wind heads us? We'll be piled up before we know it. Bowyer grunted. Leave him be, Scrafty. You knows they keeps a proper reckoning on the quarter deck. And we must have passed this way no more than half a hundred times. Ah, yes. But we're talking about a bit of a blow. At night, tide set and all, and a captain who doesn't know his ass from his elbow about ship handling. Don't forget, we gotta weather the shambles first. Ever seen him under a tide fall? <laughs> Nasty, black, and ready to tear the heart out of a good ship before you knows it, he said. But, began Kid, and by my calculation, they're just about here. Could be right on our course, mates, only a half a mile ahead and just waiting. Kid couldn't help it. He stuck his head above the bulwark and peered into the dark sea fret ahead. The Royal Albion's lantern light long since disappeared into the thick murk. In his imagination, he could see only too vividly the black rocks rearing up to smash and splinter their way into their vessel, the victorious sea close behind. At the end of the watch, they wearily slung their hammocks. I'd keep my gear handy if I was you, mate. Something happens and it's turn up the hands, came a voice from the darkness. Kid peeled off his clothes, still damp from before, and wearily swung himself in. The ship was moving more, less of a roll, more of an uncomfortable jerky pitching, which the hammock, slung fore and aft, could not easily absorb. He drifted off to sleep, and a disjointed dream arose, troubling and frightening, of himself borne away unwilling on the back of a huge wild bull, 
thundering unstoppably towards a great precipice that he somehow knew lay ahead. Waking with a start, he was confused, disoriented. Lanterns swayed and flickered in the musty gloom. Voices murmured and turned querulous. He struggled to make meaning of it all. Thumping his feet on deck, he felt the motion of the ship markedly more irregular and violent. Starbowlins! All the Starbowlins! Out or down! Out or down, you farmer's sons! Rouse out! The bosun's mates moved about quickly, urgently. There was no time to lose. Warm and pink, Kid stumbled into his damp clothes, then the awkward tub Paulins. He found himself losing his balance and crashing into cursing men half-glimpsed in the dimness. Still befuddled with sleep, he emerged up the main companionway to the open deck. As soon as his head topped the combing, he was into the full force of the gale, a turbulent, streaming wind hammering and lashing at him, wild and fearful. In the darkness he could see by the light of the binnacle that now there were four men on the wheel, leaning into it hard, grappling, straining. Spray whipped past in spiteful blasts as he staggered in the wind to the binnacle, where an unknown figure shouted in his ear, jabbing with a finger. He was expected on the main deck, down in the waist. He turned to go back down the ladder, but something made him pause. The length of deck forward was barely visible, but there was a furious grandeur in the rise and fall of the entire length of deck, an eager and responsive coupling of the ship with the wildness of the sea. A mounting exhilaration replaced Kid's fear, and instead of returning down the companionway, he staggered forward along the side of the deck, holding on tightly as he went. It was impossible to see out to the sea itself, but waves smashed on the ship's bluff sides, and he tasted the salt spray on his lips. Looking up, he saw that only some of the sails were still in place, each pale and taut as a board. A strident chorus of thrums and musical harping in the rigging gave a dramatic urgency to the scene.